Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another Forward 50 Extras. Uh, it's a little bit terrifying. This is a bunch of new stuff, and I've actually been working on this content for uh, the better part of half a year now. Uh, we were originally going to do this con this uh, session earlier in the year. Uh, things kept coming up that were more interesting than this, and so we pushed it forward. But uh, I am going to try in the next 90 minutes to give you a framework for how to think about technology in what we're calling a technology crash course. Uh, I will say that this started out as a, a bunch of lessons on different technologies, and that's still in here. But as I tried to find common threads across all the different lessons, I realized that there are some underlying questions and concepts that people need to understand that aren't necessarily about a technology, but about technology itself. And when I asked people, Many of them said, you know, I have no idea what that is. So if you're watching and you're in the comments, uh, I have a question. Can you really describe the difference between analog and digital? You don't have to try. I'm just curious if you're in LinkedIn watching this and you want to type that into chat. Tell me if you can tell the difference. Like, could you walk up to someone and, and clearly explain the difference between analog and digital? Because so much hinges on that. Now, before we get started, uh, I want to talk about where we all are. Uh, I'm personally joining you from the unceded indigenous lands of the Kanyin Kiahaka Nation. Uh, but as we're meeting in a virtual environment, we also want to acknowledge from coast to coast the ancestral and unceded territory of all First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people that call this land home. Et aujourd'hui, je vais faire mon présentation en anglais, mais si vous avez des questions en français, uh, posez-les. Je suis uh, confiant que je peux les répondre en deux langues. Uh, et uh, je suis heureux de vous parler ou discuter ceci uh, en français ou en anglais. Okay, here we go. Uh, first of all, for some context, when I was 11 years old, my father died. My mother bought me a computer and shortly after a modem. And I spent my summers as a young kid building bulletin board systems, which are a precursor to modern sites like Discord. They were really, really slow. And I can remember reaching inside my computer to push the actual physical chips into the motherboard when my computer started acting weirdly. I remember picking up the phone and listening to the carrier sound the beep, of that modem. And I could go into my computer and type something and hit enter. And I could hear that tone change as the letter I had just typed got sent down that wire. So I was born with one foot in the analog world and one foot in the digital world. Uh, there were half as many humans on the planet the year I was born, which is astonishing in itself. And none of us expected to receive news any faster than a letter. In fact, when we made transatlantic phone calls, we would uh, sit with a timer because the phone company would bill you by the minute and we didn't want to get billed for that extra minute. So we would actually spend time on phone calls and the latency would be high because the, co the signals would be bouncing off geosynchronous satellites. I'm incredibly lucky to have grown up in that analog world because it has helped me understand and stay relevant in a rapidly changing um, world today. And I didn't really realize the stack on which tech was built and understanding that was such a privilege until recently. My 11-year-old daughter is lucky as well. She has a tablet and a stylus and really geeky parents. She has access to tools that I could only dream of and she navigates Discord easily. She pinches and swipes and scrolls as easily as we read and write. But these technologies are not something we should take for granted. They're changing what it means to be human and leaving behind many as they become more mandatory just to participate in modern society. And I think we're waking up to this huge divide. So I wanna take a step way, way back to really understand what's going on here. If I cut myself and then I eat some cottage cheese, my body turns that cottage cheese into repaired skin. It does it for all of your bodies too. And we don't have to think about it. It just does it. The information for how to turn cottage cheese into repaired skin that looked like the old skin is contained in every single cell of your body. I don't think we spend enough time really thinking about that. Your entire body is made from atoms that came from the earth. And some of those elements were formed in stars. And the only reason that I, Alistair, am in this particular form able to turn cottage cheese into skin or speak or think is because of information that has assembled this particular set of atoms into neurons and created chemical pathways that turn food into oxygen, into electricity that flows through them, giving me cognition. 
That's freaky. I mean, life literally is information. The difference between this pile of atoms sitting on the floor and this pile of atoms sitting here speaking is information about how to organize them. Wait a minute, you say. This is supposed to be where I come to learn about cloud computing and AI and stuff. Well, did I come to the wrong talk? And, and I'm here to tell you, no, you haven't. Stay with me here. Information isn't just how creatures exist. It's also how societies function. It's how we communicate. Humans differ from other species in one really important way. Language is shared information. I can talk about using a rock as a tool rather than picking up a rock to demonstrate. And this is far, far more efficient in terms of time or energy or risk. In fact, I'm going to show you a tool right now. Uh, this is a Stone Age tool. This is an actual axe head. It's between 400,000 and 1.8 million years ago. Uh, I'll explain why I'm holding it and why I have one later. But remember that this particular tool we created because it was more efficient. It was a better way to focus energy. Language and the sharing of information lets humans transcend time and space. It's no exaggeration to say that language is the foundation of human society. Our brains already live in a multiverse where we can speculate on possible outcomes in other worlds. And if you want to nerd out about this more, uh, Stephen Fry has a podcast called Great Leap Years, which is an amazing foundation for this kind of thinking. But for most of human history, the main job of technology which is essentially the ability to exchange information and build societies using tools, was analog. The main job of technology was to make energy use more efficient. At first, we focused our energy. I mean, I'm not strong enough to pull a horse, but if you give me a pulley and enough rope, I can pull that horse. Ramps and levers and stones and so on are technology. This stone tool has an edge which allows me to focus energy on a specific point. Later on, we outsourced our energy in the form of slavery, beasts of burden, water wheels, steam reactors, uh, uranium reactors. These were ways of first focusing our energy and second harnessing our energy. And most of technology throughout most of human history has been in the service of focusing and harnessing engine, energy, essentially focusing and outsourcing it from elsewhere. Today, we're going to take a much narrower view because we're not going to talk about technology in general. We're going to talk about digital technology, and that's super important. The word analog technology, which is what has been happening for most of human history, is fundamentally different from digital technology. The root word analog actually has the root of the word analogy. An analog thing is an analog or a some, a something similar to something else. If you think about a record player, Vibrations from voice make a needle shake, and it leaves a groove in the record. If you put a needle on a record and amplify its vibrations, you get a slightly imperfect copy of that sound back. If you scream loudly while recording a vinyl record, you can actually look up close and see the scream on the vinyl. If you look at this illustration here in the top right corner, you can actually see that some of those lines are thinner and straighter, and some of them wave a lot. And that means that the ones that are wobbly, that's where the record is loudest. You literally have an analog of the vibrations. George W. Johnson, who was born in 1856, was a pop star in his day. He was the first African-American to sing on record. And he sold more than 25,000 wax cylinders. And to do this, he would literally play the same song, sometimes 50 times a day, while many recording devices were pointed at him. Because that's how you copied analog. And we've come a long way since that time, but all analog technology is still based on that fundamental idea that one physical thing is analogous to another. Whether that's a bunch of magnetic particles on a tape, which is what you see under an electron microscope here, or the width and height of electromagnetic pulses in a radio broadcast. But analog is a terrible way to work with information. To illustrate this, I'm going to tell you a story. Imagine that I wanted to record the number of sales I made each day. And I was going to use bricks to do this. So on a slow day, I'd only have a few piles in that brick. And on a busy day, I'd have many. Now imagine you want a copy of my sales records. You need to get your own bricks and you need to make matching piles. And the size of the piles would be analogous to the sales. You'd need more bricks to represent a busy day. Maybe you'd make a mistake or copy it wrong or run out of bricks or estimate it and get bored. And then if someone copies your record or estimates it, eventually the number gets degraded. 
worse. Imagine you needed to transport my rec sales records to show the tax authorities how much you'd earned. You need to carry a bigger pile of bricks on the busy days than on the slow ones. And nobody would do that, right? We just write down the numbers, like the digits that represented each day's sale. So I might write down four for the slow day, and I might write down 20 for the busy day and so on. The number 111 takes less ink to write than the number 88, but it's still a bigger number. Digits have nothing to do with the amount. So you can think of analog as a knob. You can turn it in tiny increments, but if someone else turns their knob to the same amount, it won't quite be the same. Digital, by contrast, is a specific number. The knob isn't turned to a, a position. It's turned to some value, 11. And so digital, at its root, just means I count it rather than making a scale representation. And digital really goes back to the uh, era of mathematics and Descartes and the desire to quantify and abstract the world. This, for example, is an analog clock. If you want to count higher, you got to add more sand. So we count, and counting is way better. And in the big scope of human history, we only really started counting things recently. Homo sapiens has been around for about 20, 000, uh, sorry, 200,000 years. And the first known use of numbers was in Mesopotamia around 5,400 years ago. They actually had different numbering systems for counting beer or milk or wooden objects. If a human history were a whole day, we really started numbering things around 1120 PM. This is a super important concept, but it's often poorly understood. Knowing, really knowing what the difference between analog and digital is, is at the root of understanding what's happening to humanity right now. Now, there are plenty of numbering systems. That Mesopotamian one had a unique symbol for every number from 1 to 60. Today, we happen to use decimal because we got 10 fingers, which was how we counted, so our numbers range from 0 to 9. But it turns out that the simplest, most powerful numbering system is binary, in which each digit has only two possible values, 0 and 1. And there are lots of cool things that you can do with binary mathematically. Digital systems are not proportional to what they're representing. It's no harder to store 10000 than it is to store 10. Whereas 10,000 bricks is a lot more than 10 bricks. When you look at this CD, you can't tell where the loud parts are and the quiet parts are. All you see is a bunch of little ones and zeros, or at least that's what the laser sees and turns back into music. So digital just means counting. Binary digital means counting with ones and zeros. And most importantly, because binary can be represented as ones and zeros, true or false, yes or no, instead of a knob, it's a switch. That means, while digital means counting, we usually equate it with binary because on and off can be stored with electricity. And electricity is cool because it travels at the speed of light and can be altered very, very, very cheaply. Remember, all of human history, all of technology is about using energy more efficiently whether that's planning with language or focusing energy with a pulley or the edge of an ax or using the energy from something else with a solar panel. In this case, binary stored with electricity allows us to work with information more efficiently than anything else. By turning information into ones and zeros and transmitting them electronically, we can do very interesting things with it, unprecedented things, things that change the nature of how information works and how life and society work. Notice that I've said, well, nothing that I've said so far is hyperbolic. Everything's just science. I haven't made any weird predictions. I'm not selling you crypto. It's natural. These changes will take generations to wash through humanity. After all, the invention of the printing press, which was a very analog thing, gave us the Reformation and the Republic. But it took a century to go from the first printing press to Martin Luther calling for the Reformation. And unfortunately, Many institutions haven't caught up with the inevitable changes that are going to happen as we move to digital, electrical, binary information technology. So we're going to talk about tech fundamentals today, but I'm not going to try and make you an expert in those technologies. Instead, I'm going to show you how digital technologies change the laws of information and why that means you need to adjust the way you think. As a species, we're in the midst of another tectonic shift from atoms to bits. And we, all of us on this call, are in the middle of that mutation. And like any mutation, there will be calamity, and many of its offspring will be mangled. This is tragic, but normal, because we are part of natural systems. 
Thing is, while the printing press changed the rules of language and the radio changed the rules of information dissemination, the switch to digital is far stranger because digital changes the rules of how rules are made. Certain fundamental laws about time and distribution and the cost of a copy and more, which we took as unchangeable up until now, have completely been upended. We aren't just talking about a new medium that organizations have to embrace, like newspaper or print. We're talking about new organizations. So I'm going to take a pause and a sip of coffee here, and I'm going to say to you, if you're watching this online, um, feel free to chime in. There's way more content in this slide deck than I can present today. And so I've chosen a few topics and technologies that I'm going to get to. But if you have specific ones you'd like me to dive into more deeply, just comment and I will be happy to try and tailor the talk to those. All right. Some fundamental concepts. I want to explain these fundamental laws before we get into the specific technologies. The biggest idea I want you to take away today is that matter, atoms, is different from information or bits. As we move from much of our society from an analog world where we represent things with an analogy for it to a digital world where we count it and we can transmit it instantaneously, much of what we understand as risk and what we understand as scarcity and what we understand as truth changes. So you need to step back and say, based on digital, what is now abundant and what is now scarce? What has become cheap and what has become expensive? What's fact and what's fiction, what's recorded and what's forgotten and so on. Let me give you some examples of this. Um, most of you are probably wearing a shirt, although I know with COVID and your cameras off, you don't have to. Uh, but a shirt used to take months to make. It was considered a luxury item. Today, most people in the world can get a shirt with a click of a button. And I do mean most humans. This is really something that we have massively upended technologically. The shirt cost got cheaper because we invented things like mass production, but it's still not free. In a digital world, copies are free. I mean, mostly free, like for most people with very little direct cost. There are definitely externalities in terms of pollution and energy consumption, and some people don't have access to tech. But if I send you a copy of something, that copy is identical to the original, and I haven't lost anything. I still have my original copy. The high cost of an additional physical unit, what's called marginal cost, is why we invented the assembly line to let make that t-shirt available. But the tiny cost of a digital unit is why we invented digital rights management to protect songs from copying or NFTs to create fake scarcity. In the digital world, a copy is free. That might seem obvious, but think it through. If copies are free, you can undo things. Because a copy is cheap, I can save a copy at any point in time and load it back in, which is kind of like a time machine. If you had a word processor and you typed out a page, you were careful. And if you made a mistake, you went back and you used whiteout to go and correct that thing. That's very different. Whereas if you're actually in a word processor, you're kind of reckless and careless. You don't care nearly as much about whether or not you can see, uh, you get it correct because you can backspace and you can change it. And so with digital, you have to ask yourself, is the thing I'm doing a one-way door, meaning there's no way I can go back? Or is it something I can undo easily? Is it something I can experiment about? Every decision you make, you now have to say, would you think differently about risk if you could go back and change the past? So copying has as a consequence the ability to undo things. There's more to it than that. Undoing things means elasticity. Elasticity means I can easily, um, I can easily, um, sorry, I'm looking at the uh, comments here and it looks like people are having uh, lag. So if you're having lag, try reloading because uh, I've had problems with the LinkedIn stream as well. Elasticity means I can scale things up and scale things down. I can shrink things and I can grow things. I can create an account or a computer virtually for nothing. And as a result, the cost needed to run an experiment, the cost to get started is tiny. In the old days, if you were setting up a business, you had to go create a business license, all sorts of things. Now you can go create an Instagram account and try and sell things and see if you get attention. And so we really have changed what matters and what the costs are. The costs are no longer in the upfront investment. They're much more in the operating cost because of the ability to copy something a hundred times, which is scaling up 
or then save those things and shrink down to one, which is scaling down. Another really important concept of this is permanence. In the physical world, things exist by default. I have to actually try to destroy something. Matter is permanent and unique and hard to change and expensive to copy. It's permanent unless we destroy it. On the other hand, information is ephemeral. It's copyable and fungible. It vanishes unless we actively maintain it. So this has all kinds of consequences for truth. If I can put fakery out there and make a thousand versions of something versus the one true version that's physically provable, I have all these issues about veracity as well. There's another important concept, and I'm going to come back to this in a few minutes, which is the difference between hierarchy and structure versus hashtags and search. In the old model, we put everything into a, a hierarchy. Yahoo, in the early days of the internet, was a giant list of hierarchies that had things like arts and humanities, news, reference, and so on. And you would click down and navigate through these things to find the category you were looking for. Google came along and said, no, no, just type a word in and we'll find it for you. This is radically different. We've gone from having to know the structure of things and fit the world into the model that we have to just pouring all the information in and letting the algorithms search it for us. There's another really important concept, which is that of iteration. Imagine that you're building a battleship. You need to get your battleship right the first time. You got to build it and then you ship it and it goes into the water. It's very hard to sort of bring the battleship back to shore and change its structure without some significant costs. So you got to get it right, which means you plan and then you launch the thing when it's ready. With digital, because it's easy to make changes, remember, you can make a copy, you can modify it if it works, you can distribute it because pushing the software out or the website out or the service out is essentially just digital means you can have constant small improvements. It's much easier to update information than it is to update matter. So that means you can release a first version and then alter or improve it. Nothing's final, but nothing's finished, which means you should spend much more of your time planning, uh, sorry, much less of your time planning and much more of your time doing. Strategy is delivery. Going ahead and starting with something and getting it to a first version from which you can then decide what to do and you can test and get feedback is much more important than having a 10,000 page document that outlines every possible outcome for something you don't even know anybody wants yet. Another important concept as a result of this transition to digital is analytics. Humans are terrible at writing things down. Machines have no choice but to do so. So this means that in a digital world, everything is tracked. I can make a copy of the records of every single transaction. And then I can slash the costs of analyzing those records with algorithms. So that means that in a digital world, we should expect transparency, metrics, and accountability to be the norm. And that we have to go out of our way not to share the information, as opposed to going out of our way to capture and analyze and share the information. And one more important concept, parallelism. With technology, because I can make bits, or copies of bits and send them out to dozens of places and then reassemble them, I can work in parallel. You've probably already seen this when you use something like Google Docs. Google Docs is not actually a word processor. Google Docs is a whole bunch of little transactions between each user where each person makes a change to the central document. And then what you're looking at is sort of the real time compilation of all those changes. You can have hundreds of people working on a document and Google Docs will resolve the changes in those documents based on who's editing them. Things can be done in parallel because what Google Docs is doing is breaking up that document into a bunch of little transactions between all the people that are working on it at the same time. This is also how search works. There's no one computer in the world that contains all of the information on the web. There are dozens and dozens, actually thousands and thousands of computers, each of which knows a little bit about the web. And every time you do a Google search or a Bing search or whatever tool you're using, you share that request with all those machines and they each chime in with the answers they have and then that's shown back to you. This also means that things like crowdsourcing are possible where you can push something out on a social network or ask people to work on a task and get the answers back. Okay, that was quite a lot to digest. So I'm gonna go through them and reiterate very quickly some of those points of what changed and what didn't. First of all, in the physical world, Copying was hard. Making a copy cost money. In the virtual or digital information world, copying is easy because a copy, which is identical, perfect copy, 
costs nothing. As a result, undoing something in the physical world was hard to do. You changed atoms. In the virtual or digital world, it's trivial. You just roll back to the earlier version. Amplifying something in the physical world was hard. You had to own a newspaper because the costs of pushing out copies of the newspaper or the costs of using up scarce parts of the uh, analog um, wavelengths of radio or television were high, and so they were regulated. In the digital world, amplifying something is easy. You just make lots of copies. Again, copies are free. In the physical world, experimentation was hard because when you did an experiment, you were actually changing the physical world. Experimenting in the virtual world is easy. You can make dozens of simulations and you can play with the copies. You can try folding protein or running Monte Carlo simulations. You're making copies and playing with them and comparing them. In the physical world, collaboration was hard. You had to be with other people because you couldn't easily share the thing you were working on. So you might paint a canvas with 10 other people as long as you weren't painting the same section. Whereas in the virtual world, it's easy because everybody works on a copy and they pull them back together. Permanence in the physical world is hard. That axe head I showed you earlier is hundreds of thousands of years old because it's permanent. Nobody had to pay the power bill to keep it working. Whereas in the virtual or digital world, Permanence is really hard. Things vanish unless we work to keep them there and pay the bill. Truth is similarly difficult. In the physical world, truth is um, it, it's hard to lie because you have biometrics. You can create proof. If someone's in front of me, I know they're not also somewhere else. In the virtual world, there's a separation of what I'm seeing and the facts that I'm using to discern whether someone is who they claim to be and what that person actually is. And as a result, it's easy to lie in the virtual world because of things like deep fakes that can manufacture what appears to be truth. Personalization is very hard in the physical world. If I want to make something bespoke and custom like a tailored suit, I have to go and tailor it to you and that costs extra money. In the virtual world, Facebook puts out a billion different news feeds every day tailored to each person. So personalization is easy because again, what we're doing is making a small variant of the virtual uh, content. And so we have an algorithm plus bits, and that makes it easy to create personalized content. Finding stuff in the physical world is hard. You put it in a folder and then you forget which folder you put it in. Whereas in the virtual world, it's easy because we can search again because of parallelism, which is a consequence of copies. And finally, analysis. It's hard to analyze what happened because there are no records in the physical world. Um, and it takes time to go through them by hand because any analysis has to be a representation of them. Whereas in the digital world, it's very easy to analyze something. We have algorithms and we have lots of data. So there's a lot of foundational ideas on this slide that you can apply to everyday technology, AI, cloud computing, analytics, cryptography, and so on. And we're going to talk about those in a minute. But before we do, I want to talk about some serious consequences that come from all this stuff because there's a lot going on behind the scenes here. For example, and this is very recent news, um, one of the courts in California just ruled that the state may make a copy of your digital content without your, uh, and you have no recourse because in the physical world, the state would say, hey, if you take someone's written records, that's seizure because you're depriving that person of those records. In other words, if I have a book with my notes, I can say, hey, you can't take that because that thing I have is my possession and you're depriving me of that thing. The court just said that you don't have any rights in that regard because by making a copy that's identical, I haven't deprived you of your right to that original good. So we've just come up with a precedent setting ruling that says that because digital content is exactly the same when duplicated, under possession law, it has different rights from something written down. In other words, if you have written notes, they have stronger legal protections than if you have a digital record. That's pretty scary. Here's another thing to think about, slightly more lighthearted. There are 60,000 songs uploaded to Spotify every day. There were years where there weren't 60,000 songs published. If you're an artist, that's an astonishing number of songs with which to compete. The reason is that the cost of making a song on a digital workstation and uploading it to Spotify 
has vanished. Instead of a recording studio and audience uh, and and uh, instruments and um, a publishing contract with a major label, you can take GarageBand and press one button to upload it to Spotify. So abundance and scarcity, possession, duplication and copying, these are all fascinating societal questions that we are only starting to tackle. And so I wanted to give you this as an initial framework because that's what makes me think about technology differently. It's not just here's how AI works or here's how cloud computing works, but understanding the underlying nature of atoms and bits and what that means for things like scarcity and privacy and copies allows us to think using those kind of first principles about technologies. So what technology should we look at? Well, I asked a bunch of people a while back on Twitter, what concepts would be important to understand if you wanted to work and thrive in a digital world? And I got a lot of feedback from it. And so I went through and analyzed all that feedback and all the messages I got from people. And I made a list that I'm not going to talk about all of them today because many of these things are interwoven. Uh, people asked about the internet, the web, open source, databases, cloud computing, AI, digital identity, front end and back end, microservices and APIs, performance, latency, encryption, blockchain. These are all pretty technical concepts. I'm going to try to explain them in non-technical ways. First of all, let's talk about the internet. At a very simple level, the internet is just a way to send things reliably to anyone else that's connected to it. Everyone connected to the internet has an address. And the internet is actually about a bunch of chunks called packets that say where they're from, where they're going, and which application they're for, like your web browser. And perhaps more importantly, those packets can have numbers on them, which means that if I send you packets one, two, three, four, and they get there in a different order, you can put them in back order, back in the order. Um, if I send you one, two, and then three gets thrown away and four, then you can say, hey, I'm missing number three. So. If you want to think about it, here's a good analogy for understanding the internet. It's the postal service. And I say the postal service, even though that seems awfully fossilized, because the postal service has different layers to it. All you have to do with the postal service is worry about the address and the stamp. You get, um, you send a stamp and the postal system basically guarantees that that thing will get to some postal code. Well, that's kind of like the internet. The internet just says, hey, if you give me something, I'll do my best to get it to the destination. And then the mail carrier brings it to your house. That's kind of like your ISP. They bring it to the internet from any one of a number of trucks and vans and airplanes. They bring it to your house from there. Uh, and so the ISP, your local provider, is kind of like the mail carrier that gets it to your house. Now, you may have an internet address, uh, and that address may be temporary or it may be permanent. Uh, there may be many people at that address, but that's kind of like the mailbox that the carrier sticks the envelope in. Uh, the envelope has a little more information on it. The envelope doesn't just have your postal code and your address, but it also says who, it, to, who it's to and who it's from. And that's kind of like an internet packet. And in theory, you could write something on the front of it that said this is envelope one of 10. Finally, there's the message. And the message is what it's about. And that's really the application, like web or mail or chat. And so there's all these different layers that are working with one another. And this is something that happens in technology, in information technology a lot, is this concept of layers. So because you have a simple set of rules that says, if you give me an envelope, I will send this envelope to a destination, you don't seem to think about that. And one of the beautiful things about the internet is this separation has allowed us to invent new things. Nobody needed permission to build a web browser because we already had the internet and someone went, well, I'm just going to send things to and from these web servers. And that was okay. If tomorrow you wanted to wake up and build an entirely new application, that relied on the internet, you could do so because of that separation. That's huge. And it's one of the reasons why the internet has been able to scale the way it has, is that each of these layers is independent of the others. I can replace my ISP and everything else keeps working. And so there's very clear rules about how your ISP talks to the internet or how your ISP gives you an IP address or how that IP address receives and sends internet packets. And as long as each of those rules is working okay, you can go replace your router without breaking anything. That's very different from like remodeling your kitchen and having to replace the stoves and stuff. In this case, each piece is separate and atomic. Now I'm gonna show you something that looks a little nerdy, but don't worry, it isn't. Um, these are machines between me and the Canadian government's website. At the top, you can see my address 
That's the machine I'm on. Uh, and then my ISP. Uh, and then you can see some data on the internet where it's going through Kojeko and a bunch of other things. And eventually it gets to Bell in Toronto and then it goes to Canada.ca. This tells us that the Canada.ca website is hosted by Bell Canada or at least connected to by Bell Canada. So this is simply the things along the way. You can think of one of them as the mail carrier and the next one as a truck and the next one as an airplane and so on. Um, and some of these are close and some of them are far away, but you can actually go and look at the connections between you and somewhere else. Now, if you want to get really nerdy, you can go inside your computer and you can say, show me all the connections my computer has going on right now. So I did this when I was putting the talk together and you can see over on the left TCP. Don't worry about that. That's just the, the thing that gives you pipes on the internet that you can send things over. But I can see in here, there's a bunch of things that say EC2 dash something. That's Amazon's Elastic Compute Cloud. That means that one of the websites I'm using is getting stuff from Amazon. You can also see things like my computer talking to something on the same network. That's like my computer talking to the printer in my house. And then you can see this thing called localhost. That just means talking to itself. So it's not just that we use the internet to talk to other machines. Sometimes we use it to talk to machines in our house and sometimes even other applications on the same server. This means anything can talk to anything cheaply. And because messages are broken into tiny chunks, you can't cut the wire easily. If one mail carrier gets sick, the postal service doesn't stop. If one mail truck is delayed, the service doesn't stop. Because of this modularity, the internet is just a machine for making copies and getting them where they're going to go. Little tiny chunks that are sent all over the place. That's it. That's all you really need to know about the internet. Now, what should you need to know about this? Most people can't look inside their machines. When I looked at that list of things, I had a little freak out. I was like, wait, do I know what all of these are? Maybe I've been hacked and maybe I have. We genuinely don't know what's going on under the hood. So malware and cybersecurity are at risk. And the digital divide is real and growing. Having an internet connection is a requirement for participation in modern society. It's also so easy to make things on the internet that most of the internet is outdated. That means that when you bought that new device, um, when you bought that new device, you, um, you may have may find that it doesn't get updated and then it's vulnerable. Um, I'm seeing Vanessa asking questions about how the message is the app. So I will explain that to you, Vanessa. Let's say that um, you received five letters from me. And one of the letters said, regarding our last conversation about education at Dawson College, here are my thoughts. And the next one said, here's that bill I owed you. And the next one said, here are some photos of our time in the Laurentians last week. Those are three different conversations. One's got pictures. One is a financial transaction, and one is a part of an ongoing conversation. Um, that's really something where you would go, hey, this photo belongs in my photo album. This letter is something I have to respond to. This financial information is something that I need to add to a spreadsheet. And so in a human analogy here, you have different apps you're running, photos, correspondence, spreadsheets. And when you take that message out of the envelope, you look at it and decide which one it's for. On the internet, you actually have a little number that tells you what it's for. So if it begins with 80, it's for web. If it begins with 443, it's for secure web. And there's other numbers for email and DNS and so on. So that little envelope would actually say, hey, this is supposed, this is for Vanessa, but it's not just for Vanessa, it's for Vanessa's photo album. That's a little bit of a, a, a split there. But that kind of explains how the envelope tells it what app to send things to. So what is the web? Because I talked about the internet there, but the internet can be lots and lots of different things. The web is not actually the same as the internet. I know that seems weird, but like the web is just the thing that's easiest to use that most of us use. And so the way the web works is pretty simple. A browser talks to a server and the server gives it stuff back. That's actually not that simple. What actually happens is this. The browser goes, hey, I would like to talk to you. This is called a synchronization or TCP SYN request. And the server goes, sure, let's talk. And then there's back a, okay, hey, now we're talking. So this is called a three-way handshake. And that way, both sides have had a conversation with the other side and there's a connection. Now, the computers might go, hey, someone may be listening. So let's share secret internet keys that allow us to encrypt stuff. Uh, I will talk more about that in a minute. Now those keys have been exchanged. Now we can communicate clearly. Your browser goes, hey, can I have the homepage, please? And oh, by the way, I was here before. Here's a cookie so you can remember me from last time because that way I'm already logged in or whatever. 
The responding server goes, all right, that's fine. Good to see you. HTTP 200 just means, yep, I've got the information you want. You've probably heard of other HTTPs like 404 means it's an error. The content's not here. Or 500 means it's an error. The network's not working. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, and then after thinking for a while, that computer will send back the message you want um, and it will send back other things that it may decide that you need. And you may uh, look at that message and go, hey, that's great, but um, I'd like to have a an image that was on that page. Oh, okay, here's the image. This conversation goes on and you get the pages you want. And then at the end, you go, all right, I'm done. Thank you very much. That's what's actually happening for every single website you visit. There's these conversations happening constantly in real time. And this protocol, this structure has served us incredibly well since Tim Berners-Lee first defined the internet. And there are standards bodies that update this stuff. And we constantly fix these things. And there's lots of risks to it. But this has served us well and connected billions and billions of humans. Unfortunately, the web is kind of dying. Applications give organizations much more control. Most of the way we access the internet today is not through web browsers, but through apps. We're loading Facebook or Twitter or whatever else. And apps are kind of taking over from websites, which is a little bit scary. Um, you can't inspect an app the way you can a website. If you're on a website, you can right click and say view source and see what's there. But if you try to right click on an image, then you can't collect that image and save it because it's the app. You might be able to screenshot it, but you can't save the content or inspect the content. And the web, which made the internet so easy, um, it, it, the web made, made the internet so easy, but we now rely on websites to do other things. So you probably use a web-based client to chat or to use email, or you use the app that you've got for chat or for email. So this idea that we are now running a web and an email and a chat client, as opposed to having an app that does it or using something like Gmail where it's web-based is really blurring the separation of the different layers that I showed you earlier. And as soon as you conflate those layers, as soon as you force a monolith out of those layers, you get rid of the ability for one layer to change independent of the others. It's almost anti-competitive in some ways. Now, it makes things much easier. It's far easier for someone to use an app than to set up their own mail server and stuff. But the risk here is that because apps give organizations much more control, they're seductively easy. But at the same time, we get rid of the biodiversity that was possible because of these layers of the internet. It's much harder to build a new thing. So that's a little bit about the internet and about um, uh, the web in general. But I want to give you a little more detail on the next topic. Uh, and the next topic is databases. So if the internet is how we talk to things and the web is how we kind of visualize things, what we're doing behind the scenes is looking at data. And data is incredibly important because while the internet is just a technology, data is about humans. It's about us. And it has incredibly important consequences for things like privacy and scale and, and even um, uh, marginalization. A database is simply a way of storing information. It's kind of like a filing cabinet. But unlike filing cabinets, databases store information about that information. So I may store Vanessa's name, but I may also store how I know Vanessa, where the information came from about Vanessa, how often I've looked at that information about Vanessa. Whatever that thing is, I may be storing data about the data. That's called metadata. And that's really important because if I have data about myself, that's interesting. But if I have data about myself and how I'm related to all of my friends, I now have a way of understanding my social graph and the people I'm related to. Once upon a time, we stored information in libraries, and then we stored it in databases, and today we store it in what are called data lakes. And the way we collect data has changed dramatically in the last 50 years. In the past, when we collected information, we had a knowledge about what it was and how we'd use it before we collected it. And then we put that information into databases and we knew what it was for. If we were collecting quarterly sales figures by store, by sales rep, and by product, we would create a table and we'd put columns in that table, think of a spreadsheet, for store and sales rep and product because storage was expensive. And so data warehouses took time to manage and what lived in our databases had structure. I basically got my filing cabinet and I made all the folders beforehand and I labeled them beforehand and then I started putting my filing into it. This is schema or structure first. Big data, which is an expression 
that really sums up the fact that we can store and analyze data very, very quickly um, has a totally different approach. Big data is gather everything, kind of collect it on faith, drink from the fire hose. We don't know how we'll use it yet. We store it because we think it'll be useful later, and we have a good reason to think so because we can analyze it quickly. And that data that we're storing is not just the columns and rows you might see in a spreadsheet. There's a lot of different structures of data. The thing on the right here is actually something LinkedIn used to suggest called your LinkedIn in graph that showed me and all the people I was connected to. And without me telling it anything about it, it had inferred that some people I knew from different jobs or different conferences or different organizations. Data can be stored in lots of different ways. It could be a key value database or a time series database or an object database. For example, a graph database is a way of storing people or entities and their relationships to other things. So we have data, we have lots of different kinds of filing cabinets to put it in. But what you really need to understand is how we've changed from a model where we ask first and then collect to a model where we collect first and then ask. So in the old way, I would say, hey, I got to record the widgets I've sold by city, by size, and by color. So I define a schema. Think of this as making a spreadsheet. You put in three columns, one for the size, one for the color, one for the city. You collect the data from all your stores. You put it into this data report, and then you make a report. Well, great. Why are sales down by a certain city? I don't know. There's nothing in there to explain that. Maybe it's the weather. So then you say, could you go like get more data and make a new column called what the weather was like? And then we go make that data and we start again. It's exhausting. The new way is to collect first and then ask. So you collect all the things, everything you possibly can. And then you can ask the data a question. Give me a report of widgets by size, color, and city at which point the database goes and finds those things and structures them. This is called an emergent schema or schema on read. It just means we figure out what the data is about when we ask questions of the data, rather than figuring out what the data is about before we save the data. So maybe it's the weather. Then I go get the weather by uh, the widgets by weather and that doesn't show anything. Maybe it's political affiliation. So I go find political affiliation. Oh, well, maybe it's uh, widgets by a uh, uh, political party. Now I know that I've got an actionable decision and I can only really sell this, this stuff to a particular political party. This is the kind of exploration and iteration we see in modern databases. And so that means that the cycle really changed here, right? You used to ask a question to find the schema, collect the data, answer the question, refine the problem. But now it's collect the data, ask a question, get the schema explore the data, get the schema, explore the data, get the schema, and so on, and then answer the question. This is really a collect first, ask questions later approach. And it has some interesting and serious privacy consequences because when you're arbitrarily capturing everything, well, that's great that you're capturing everything, but maybe you've caught things that should be private. And so there are a lot of privacy regulations trying to govern this stuff. Here's a reason why I think this is really important. And it has to do with the Medici. The Medici were an Italian family of merchants. They were one of the first to employ accounting techniques. And many of the things that they came up with uh, still with us today, hundreds and hundreds of years later. One of the concepts they had was the idea of a general ledger in accounting, where you would know what to file. You might take your cup of coffee. This is my cup of coffee. And you would normally know that this gets filed in a certain place. So for example, uh, you could file this under people, Alistair or you could file it under beverages, coffee, or you could file it under containers, cup. Let's say you put this in the filing system under containers, cup. Alistair has bought one coffee and you take a piece of paper and it says, Alistair had a cup of coffee and you put it in the containers folder. Well, that's great, but now if I wanna search by person, how do I see the things that Alistair's drunk? If I wanna measure how much coffee we're consuming, how do I check that? I can't. If I make a copy of that record and I put one in the coffee folder and one in the Alistair folder and one in the cup folder, well, now when I change one of those records, the one that's in the cup folder, I don't change the other two. And now my database is all corrupt. That's bad. Um, we have a new thing called hashtags. I could just take this cup and I could tag it with Alistair and coffee and cup. And then because search is so cheap, I could just say, show me all instances of Alistair or all instances of coffee or all instances of cup and get that data. This is a big change because... The accounting industry is trillions of dollars and the accounting industry has not caught up with this kind of change. So thinking about data in terms of labels because hashtags and tags are a way of doing things cheaply and abundantly is massively different. 
If you're building a government website, for example, why are you still forcing people to navigate down a hierarchy instead of taking that thing that applies to them and letting them find it wherever it's relevant? We have to rethink the way we structure and store information from one of hierarchies to one of searches and hashtags. And that's massively different. If you were to overhaul the accounting systems of the world, that's trillions of dollars of software that are outdated because they're still using a filing approach that was invented by a bunch of Italians 600 years ago. Maybe it's time we updated that. Another secret of data that you need to think about is that cleaning is most of the work. 80% of the time that people spend working with data is cleaning the data up, and we often ignore this. We're also terrible at statistics. Um, this is something called Anscombe's Quartet. I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but basically what it says is that these four diagrams that you see all have the same average, have pretty much the same standard deviation. These are all things that um, statistically, if you analyze them, look the same using math. But then when you plot them on a chart, you see they aren't. And so it's actually really, really dangerous to use statistics to understand what's going on. Um, one of the things that data really requires us to do now that it's so free and available is to think critically. Let's say we want to reduce traffic accidents. So the first thing you might ask is what causes traffic accidents? Well, we look up the data and it says, hey, it turns out more accidents happen near home. So maybe we should make people you know, much, we should have a campaign to get people to drive safely at home, or we shouldn't have people driving at home. But that's accidents over time. Of course, more accidents happen near home, because more accidents happen when you're driving, and most of the time is spent driving. So is it um, more accidents in urban areas by suburban drivers? Well, maybe, but that's unfamiliarity. Are there more traffic interactions in dense urban areas? Is it that suburban people driving downtown have accidents? Or is it that in dense urban areas, there's more signs, more passing cars, more turning, more emerging? And then you got to ask yourself, what data would I need to collect that information? I would need to collect things like accidents per driving event, passing a car, a sign, and so on. And then say, well, how do I get that data? It's really hard to get a good question, a good answer to what causes traffic accidents, even though it might seem simple. Because each time you get the data, you have to ask yourself, could I be delusional? Could this be a false correlation? Could this be something that I'm not properly understanding? <coughs> Excuse me. Another thing I really want to bring up is the incredible risk of revisionist history in data. As I mentioned earlier, it's hard to change physical things because they're permanent, but it's easy to change digital things because they're transient. We have concrete proof of this happening. We've discovered uh, unmarked graves throughout Canada, who knows how many, that were essentially erased from information. And we can only find them because the physical attributes are still there. The fact that things are searchable with precision means that they can also be erasable with precision. Uh, Ada Palmer has an amazing post on speaking freely where she asks, how do we protect digital history from those who would hide in its revisions? This is a very real risk to society, to truth, to reconciliation, and to making sure that we don't um, gloss over or revise the atrocities of human past. There's also some really scary stuff that can happen. Um, this is a feature on Facebook that they launched for a while ago and then took down, and I had access to it for a while called Facebook Graph Search. Um, and so these are uh, this one is uh, married people who like prostitutes and their spouses. This was a search you could actually run on Facebook. Um, here's Islamic men who live in Tehran and are interested in men and their friends and where they've worked. Clearly, data plus algorithms has a tremendous risk to society, and we have to figure out uh, how to better regulate this stuff in order to protect the most vulnerable. Okay, we talked about the internet and the web. We talked about big data. Now I want to talk about cloud computing briefly. Uh, I know this is a lot of content, and I'm hoping you're all still with me. Uh, let's talk about clouds. Cloud computing is simply paying for computing work instead of computing hardware. The reality is that you're not using something all the time. In England, cars are parked 96% of the time. We're not using cars efficiently. Well, we're not using computers efficiently either. My computer, even though I'm live streaming this to people, is not fully busy. Pooling resources gives access to other things as well. So when you rent computing from a service instead of owning a server, you get access to technical expertise you couldn't afford. 
There's redundancy because there's lots of spare machines. You have machines in multiple physical locations, which makes you more resilient. But most importantly, cloud computing reduces the unit cost. If each of these blue squares is a computer and your computer uses the red line, you can see that it's much more efficient to be able to scale up and down across part of a machine like that. Scaling up and down happens a lot because of spiky workloads. It was one of my favorite charts. This is water consumption in Edmonton during the Olympic gold medal hockey game um, in 2010. And you can see the spikes here, and you can see that during the four periods, people went to the bathroom. Uh, clearly, there are spikes in demand for everything from water use when people use the toilet in between the periods of the hockey game uh, to the uh, use of computing systems. And so when workloads like computing are spiky, you can think of elections, for example, sudden rise in demand or a breaking news story or sudden traffic. Having non-dedicated resources makes a lot more sense. Today, there's other reasons for doing it. If you go look at Microsoft or Amazon or some other cloud computing offering, they have a ton of different services. They don't just have computers. They also have storage. They also have content delivery networks and authentication and messaging. In fact, Amazon has dozens and dozens of services that you can use on demand. So you don't need to build a machine and put everything on it yourself. You can just use these services. And that means instead of hiring a team to develop a cache or to develop uh, a storage system or a database, you just go, I want to use that database. And you'll pay by the drink for the database and the computing and so on. There are really three kinds of clouds out there. Uh, one is what's called infrastructure as a service. That means you're renting machines. So if you have a server in your house, you take that server, you put it into Amazon Web Services in what's called EC2, the Elastic Compute Cloud, and that machine lives virtually. Platform as a service is a little different. Platform as a service, I rate the code, and then I run it on a, a machine in the cloud, but I don't see the machine. It could be running on one machine or 10. It could be running in any data center. I don't know where it is. I don't stop the machine, but it's running that code for me. And then software as a service, I don't run the code either, but I'm using software and what I'm doing is moving the content and the permissions to it. So Amazon and Azure are really move the machines, something like Hadoop, uh, which is a cloud that runs specific programming languages. I'm moving the code. And then a tool like Salesforce, for example, uh, I move the content to Salesforce, my contact list, and then the permissions, who can access it, and so on. So I gave you a postal service as an analogy for thinking about the internet. Consider uh, the car industry as a way of thinking about cloud computing. When you decide you need a computer, you have a lot of options. There's a lot of business models available for a car user. Uh, the one extreme, you could be a car manufacturer. You'd have, to com you'd have complete control over every aspect of your car, but your cost would be incredibly high. You could build cars from parts. You get them road certified. This wouldn't scale very well as demand increased. So this is really about hobbyists who need high customization or large manufacturers who need economies of scale. But one way to get a car is to become a car company and set up a manufacturing line. For most of us, the answer to transportation is to own a car. You're not responsible for design and you have some choice of models and features, but you're liable for everything. You have to finance it, you have to maintain it and so on. And so this is kind of the equivalent of buying a computer as opposed to you know creating a computer from scratch. If you're a traveler, you rent. And this is a different model with different responsibilities. You're still at fault if you scratch or hit something and you still need to know the directions to your destination, but someone else finances the deal and handles storage and cleaning and other things. And you're not paying for what you use, um, if you're only paying for what you use. You're not paying for the whole asset. A car hire service abdicates even more control. You can still decide where to go or how to get there, pick up and drop off times, but everything else is the driver's responsibility. You have only marginal control over the car model or even how clean it is. A taxi takes this to the ultimate extreme. This is pay as you drive economics. Nothing's your fault, provided you're well behaved in the back seat. You have no control over the platform. And so what we really have here is a spectrum. These are degrees of abdication and abstraction. Sometimes a taxi makes sense. For example, when you're going from one place to another in a city. Other times building your own makes sense if you're landing on the moon and need a moon rover. Clouds are the same thing. You have to decide how much abstraction you're willing to put up with and how much responsibility you're willing to abdicate and then choose the solution that's right on a case-by-case -case basis. So it's not about picking a supplier. It's about deciding the nature of your workload and the amount of authority and control and abstraction you need over it. 
there's a pretty easy way to think about um, what you should worry about here. I explained earlier that there's infrastructure as a service, which is basically virtual hardware, like having rented metal. There's platforms as a service, which is where you run code. And then there's software as a service, which most of us are familiar with, something like a WordPress or a Salesforce. There's also private and public clouds. You might have your own cloud infrastructure. If you're the government of Canada, for example, you might have cloud computing that's in a private area that you run yourself, but it's still shared across government departments. And then there's a public cloud like Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure and so on. If you just know these two dimensions, what kind of cloud you're looking at and whether it's public or private, what you should worry about changes significantly. For example, if you're using a public cloud, you're probably concerned about security fears because when you're in public, other people can get to it. So discussions around privacy and security are vital to public clouds, making sure that nobody can steal your account and making sure that you manage permissions properly. It should be said that those cloud providers probably have better security people than you do. Uh, so it's less about whether or not you're going to have someone smart looking at your security and more about whether your processes for working with stuff that travel, travels across the internet are reliable. If you're using software as a service or platform as a service, you should be concerned about lock-in. I'm using this tool, how easily can I leave? If I'm using a CRM, can I take my data and move it somewhere else? So that's where you wanna do a deep dive is really go into your contracts and say, how do I get the data out? How quickly can I take it and put it on another vendor and have it still work? If you're looking at private cloud, well, the real question here is, is this gonna get expensive over time? Do you really need to own it yourself? Because you're doing a lot more work than you need to keeping this stuff yourself if the public gets better economies of scale. Organizations like Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Azure and other cloud providers get much better economies of scale because when you're not using a machine, someone else is. And finally, if you're down at the low level at the infrastructure as a service, you're still gonna have to manage those machines, whether they're virtual or physical, you're gonna have to delete them and, and manage them and measure them and upgrade them. Wouldn't it be better to just worry about the software or the code and have someone else worry about the machines? So those are kind of the four dimensions that you really need to worry about for cloud computing. Well, that's a lot of stuff. We're gonna try a couple more here if you're still with me. Let's talk about AI and machine learning. This is one of my favorite topics. It's something around which there has been a tremendous amount of confusion lately. At its simplest, AI is simply a system that analyzes data and draws conclusions from that data without any explicit instructions. This is often things like classifying, creating an algorithm by showing a computer lots of examples and having it infer what they have in common. I show you a lot of cats and not cats. The computer understands what, it, what looks like a cat and what doesn't, and then it has a model, and it can then classify future pictures of cats and not cats. Um, there's also... Uh, prediction, which is where you go, this is what I think will happen in the future. So this is what I think a cat looks like, or this is based on the trend we've seen in the stock market. This is what I think the stock will do in the future. And then there's automation, which is, hey, try and take the best course of action based on what happened in the past that worked. Um, algorithmic computers have been around for decades. Algorithms have been used to calculate loan rates, detect credit fraud, do scientific simulations, and more. Machine learning is different, though, because those algorithms were inferred rather than written by a human. And algorithms are actually really good. Daniel Kahneman has looked at how inconsistent humans are at their jobs, and he's assigned tests to various people and said, try and predict something. If you ask a bunch of software developers to estimate how long a task will take, their estimates vary by 71%. If you ask pathologists to assess the severity of a biopsy, there's only a 0 0.61, uh, 0 0.61 correlation meaning 1.0 would be perfect, they actually can't predict it very well. In two large companies, uh, schedule prediction was like 60%. You basically said to people, predict how long this thing will take, and executives said they gave their predictions a 60% difference. And more interestingly, experience on the job did not reduce the noise. People who'd worked at the company for five years were also wrong. So Kahneman says the unavoidable conclusion is that professionals often make decisions that deviate from those of their peers, from their own decisions, and from rules they claim to follow themselves. In other words, algorithms are really good for us. There are great reasons to rely on algorithms and automation rather than being subject to human bias if those algorithms are properly constructed and tested. This is kind of what algorithms look like when humans make them. 
you know, do I have to leave the house today? Yes or no? Well, if I do have to leave the house, then I probably need to ask whether it's raining. If not, I'm wearing my house coat and bunny slippers. And if it's rainy outside, then I'm going to wear my umbrella and some boots. If not, I'm going to wear a vest and loafers. This is the kind of Boolean logic decision tree kind of stuff that we've used in the past. Statistics is slightly different. Statistics can be used for classifying things to find out like what's the line that is the most distant from two different groups or what's the trend within that. Now, when we are trying to use AI, we might feed it data like this. Here are stars and diamonds, red stars, blue diamonds. And we ask the AI, hey, where do you think the line is between the two? And the AI would say, hey, I think that this is the best place to split the two. So future stars will go over here on the left and future diamonds will go over here on the right. All right, that's a pretty good prediction. But it's only along one dimension. So now let's do it with two dimensions. Now I have red stars on the left, blue stars on uh, blue diamonds on the right, and then red stars and blue diamonds at the back in another group. Well, that's pretty interesting. Now I can sort of see there's three clusters because I've added another dimension. Let's add another dimension called size. Well, when I add size, I see that the ones in the back are all higher. And then I add labels to them and I say all the red labels are female and all the blue labels are male. So wait a minute, this looks different. I got a bunch of women, young women on the left or smaller women on the left. I got a bunch of small men on the right and I got men and women in the middle. What's going on here? Now I add another dimension. Well, it looks like it's a high school dance and everybody's starting to mingle. And now I have context of that thing because I've added time and I can see where they're all moving. But an algorithm can handle thousands of dimensions. Human brains get stuck at like four or five here we're talking about thousands. All I had there was uh, left, right, up, down, uh, forward, backwards, and time, and it started to make sense. People are now starting to use machine learning to, to uh, identify cancer, for example, from blood samples by looking over time, training it on examples of blood from cancerous and non-cancerous patients, and then figuring out where these clusters are and how to analyze them. So is this prostate cancer, lung cancer, or normal based on blood? And AI is insanely good at coming up with these things. First, we train it, and then we evolve it ruthlessly. You may have heard of AlphaZero, which beat every chess program that was out there. But if you played 1.2 billion games of chess and remembered only the games that you'd won, you'd probably be pretty good too. I should note that it played this many games of chess in a matter of a few days, and that's what's staggering about machine learning. There are two common AI approaches. Uh, one is to generate new things based on a set of old ones, and the other is to classify things that belong or don't belong in a set. You can use this in pretty surprising ways. Uh, you can tell one algorithm to predict what poetry will be look will look like. So have it make algorithm, uh, feed it a bunch of poetry and go predict more poetry. And then you can tell the other algorithm to distinguish human written poetry from non-human written poetry and let them fight. So the one that's writing poems is trying to trick the other one into thinking those poems were written by a human. This is called generative adversarial AI. It's two algorithms fighting with one another. And while it seems innocuous to have an algorithm win a poetry award, these people don't exist. These people were created by an algorithm. You can kind of tell because the person on the right-hand side of the screen the man on the right has ears in different positions. And that's usually a dead giveaway for fake stuff is the, uh, the ears are off. But it's getting really, really hard to understand this stuff. You can also have AIs make art. You tell one to make random forms of art and have the other one distinguish um, art that falls easily into a category like Renaissance painters or pointillism from one that doesn't. And it will come up with novel kinds of art. Lately, we've learned how to train algorithms to express knowledge based on the past. So we use this thing called GPT. Um, GPT is an algorithm, in this case, GPT-2 is an adventure game. And uh, in, in the example that's here, the adventure game is something you can play. And so um, here is a game where you're, you're playing a game with a computer and you write things and it gives you responses. So it says, hey, a unicorn sitting at the top of the screen, eat the unicorn, it says go west, fish, Tell the troll about the future of education. It's going to come up with things like this. And it says, um, when, you, uh, when you talk to the troll, he says, I'd watch out if I were you. That's a computer making that up. So um, one of the weird things about GPT-3 is it knows how to have a normal conversation, but it doesn't really know how to say that's nonsense. If I ask it, how do you sporgle a morgle? 
it might come back, you sporgle a morgle by using a sporgle. How many bonks are in a quoit? There are three bonks in a quoit. How many rainbows does it take to jump from Hawaii to 17? It takes two rainbows to jump from Hawaii to 17. These are clearly nonsense. Although with a small tweak, we can now make an algorithm that when you ask it something like how many bonks are in a quoit, it goes, yo, be real. So the weird thing about GPT is that it's getting pretty good, but it often lies. So it will take data that's provably false, but because it's been trained on the internet, it pulls that up. If it's cold outside, it tells us that global warming is a hoax. Not true, but basically GPT is just analyzing the language of the internet. And as we've seen, the internet is not a great place to be analyzing language from. But maybe sentience is just understanding the statistics of language. This is an example of wise being, which is a GPT application, GPT-3 application where you talk to it about, um, you have a conversation with it. The conversation is pretty amazing. Um, here is an example where uh, you write a prompt that says, here's a poem by Dr. Zeus about Elon Musk launching rockets with SpaceX. And he writes a poem or the, the algorithm writes a poem. Once there was a man who really was a musk, he liked to build robots and rocket ships and such. He said, I'm building a car that's electric and cool. I'll bet it outsells those gasoline burning clunkers soon. They sell cool cars that are electric and cheap. And then he wanted to go even farther, you see. This is a computer writing this algorithm. You have to ask yourself, can a computer write jokes? Well, if you feed the computer um, a prompt, it will come back with, here are some pranks that you can play for April Fool's jokes. Uh, some of them are interesting. There's different uh, algorithms out there, Curie, Babbage, Ada, and DaVinci, all GPT. And some of these are actually okay jokes. Weirdly, I can then take those jokes and I can say, hey, draw me a picture from it. And then GPT-3 will actually make art. So what did we just see there? I mean, we gave a computer a prompt. It made some art. It made a comic strip. It drew another version of that comic strip. That's pretty remarkable. So what should we worry about? Well, with AI, there's lots of stuff to worry about. Uh, current AI assumes that the future will be like the past. If I run, uh, if I'm using AI that was developed uh, two years ago, it probably won't know about residential schools or George Floyd. It assumes it's overly narrow. It has no judgment or moral compass to decide if something is right or wrong. And there's no recourse. You can't go to an AI and convince it based on new data that it should change its answer because it's just using inferences from the data it was fed. Uh, you can trick them pretty easily. You can change an image a little bit and the AI will go from thinking something is a turtle or a baseball to rifle or an espresso because algorithms are only as good as what they eat. We are training algorithms and AI on data. And when that data is biased, you often get bad results. For example, uh, with word to vec which is a big data source that we've used to train data, uh, doctor is to man as nurse is to woman, probably something we don't want. And marginalization happens a lot. I purposely split that high school gym into male and female dancers. When we create an algorithm, we're encoding a worldview. You may not have noticed that I was extremely exclusionary by saying male and female or men and women. There's probably a lot more in there. And those models need to be updated, but the data in the past may not include that. So when we create an algorithm or we let an algorithm infer something from data, we're encoding a worldview at a moment in time and that worldview needs to be updated from time to time. Clearly there's lots to think about. I'm gonna go through a couple more components and ideas here and then wrap things up. I wanna talk a little bit about microservices and APIs. This sounds very technical, but I'm gonna tell you a different story. Economist Herbert Simon, says that um, modularity is really important by talking about two watchmakers, one named Hora and one named Tempus. These two watches, these two watchmakers had watches that had about a thousand parts each that had to be assembled. And Tempus made watches that had to be assembled at once. So if he put that watch down, he had to start again from scratch. But Hora designed her watches out of sub-assemblies. 10 pieces made a sub-assembly, 10 of those could be put together and 10 of those made the whole. As you can imagine, Tempus's system was much more reliable than Hora's. Hora had an incredibly difficult task ahead to assemble systems. Tempus was able to assemble them out of parts and therefore break things up into tasks that could be shared. In a digital world, we have to think about Lego everywhere. Building things in modules like Tempus did allows machines to talk to machines and code to talk to code. 
And I'll give you an example of how this works in a minute. But the idea here is that if you build things from modules and components, just like the internet was built from layers, those teams can be independent. And each module just needs to work properly with the things next to it. Lego has a contract. The contract is the bottom of the thing will stick to little pegs and the top of the thing will have pegs. And as long as every part follows that contract with the right measurements, Lego just works. Modularity is really good because small groups can own and test each part of it. And improvements to one thing benefit all the things. So I want to give you an example, which is called Amazon Web Services. I mentioned this earlier as a cloud computing tool. Amazon is broken up into small teams. Jeff Bezos calls these two pizza teams. And his point there is that you have enough, a small enough team you can feed it with a couple of pizzas. The first service that Amazon built was called S3, simple scalable storage um, in the cloud that you could store things with. And the, all Amazon S3 did was if you sent an object like an image to S3, it gave you back a unique URL. And if you sent the URL to S3, it gave you back the image. That's it. There's a little more around authenticating that you were allowed to do it and stuff. But at its core, all it had to do was do one thing really fast. If I give you an object, you give me a URL. If you give me, if I give you a URL, you give me an object. And with that, I can store things. That's it. The amazing thing is that with that really simple contract, that really simple, tiny little service, I could build all kinds of stuff. I could give it a saved computer, a virtual machine. I could give it an image, an audio recording. I could give it all kinds of data. And so that ability to really break stuff down into tiny little utilitarian modules was great because if Amazon built all of its services on that and then you figured out a way to make that service faster, everybody benefits. You don't have to change all of the other services. You just change that module. And that's very different from the highly interconnected components we see in the analog world. When you're shipping the battleship once, you may as well just make everything the same and build it all at once. When you are updating parts of the thing, you make them modular. And so this idea of microservices and APIs, APIs are just application programming interfaces. They're just ways for one computer to talk to another across a very clearly defined interface. And you can think of the interface as the bottom of the Lego. What I'm trying to do is, here is give you analogies for thinking about stuff. So when it comes to modularity and APIs, you should think about Lego. Uh, when it comes to the internet, you should think about the postal service and so on. And when it comes to algorithms, you can think about high school dances if you want. One of the things that matters a lot on the internet and on tech in general is performance. And we don't really understand performance much. So I'm just going to touch on this quickly. Um, you can think of performance as a river. If there's information flowing from one place to another, that's like water. Bandwidth is how wide the river is. Latency is how fast the water is flowing. Throughput is how much water moves through it. Because most conversations on the internet have a back and forth between them where I'm going to send messages, I send information to something and get a response back. That's called round trip time. And there's always going to be some delay. In fact, this, this always blows my mind, but there's a 13 millisecond latency from Montreal to Las Vegas because of the speed of light. Like the speed of light matters it, on a relativistic scale. Las Vegas is 13 milliseconds behind me. That's kind of freaky. And I'm going to end with one final lesson, which is about encryption and crypto cryptography. I have lots of technologies we could talk about, but I've kind of cherry picked the ones that I think are the most controversial and important. At its simplest, encryption is a way of transforming a message to limit who can see it and to ensure that it hasn't been modified. So you can think of it as putting in an envelope that can't be opened, but if someone tries to open it, you can see that they ripped the envelope. So I'm going to give you a crash course of encryption here. I have two people here, two characters here, on the left and on the right. And if I had a decoder ring, if I had one of those little um, magic decoders that they used to sell as toys, and I send the decoder to my friend, then I can take a message and send it to my friend. And my friend, I can put it in an envelope, send it to my friend, and my friend can open up that envelope using the decoder ring and read the message, which is great, except there might be spies in the middle. And that spy in the middle has a copy of my decoder ring. And so they can read any messages I send. Someone with the key can decode it, but the bad guys can't figure it out. That decoder ring I just showed you was actually something from Captain Midnight, which is a radio show that happened in the 19th century, uh, 20th century. Um, where they would read things on the radio and kids at home using the decoder ring would be able to decrypt the message. 
but the bad guys couldn't decode the message. Uh, so Captain Midnight sent these messages out to everybody over time uh, to all his special secret squad members. The problem with this model is that I got to share that key. If I'm sharing things and I say, I'm going to send the number one, and the number one gets translated back to A, anybody who has that encoding key can decrypt my message. And we came up with other ways of encoding things that are harder to break, like the Enigma machine and so on. But the problem is, on the underlying, uh, on the on the internet, is that data is like a postcard. I can't send a key to somebody I've never met before without everybody else seeing it. I might be able to send a spy with an encoder ring or, you know, only people with my Enigma machine can see the message. But that doesn't help me much if everything I send is on the internet. The internet's a copying machine. So how do I send someone the key? Eventually, someone steals the code and figures it out, and then they can read secret messages. They can send secret messages if they were you. So we came up with this new thing called public key encryption. And this part is where most people get lost on cryptography, but I'm gonna try and make it as simple as possible. I have a private key. It's the thing that only I have. And there's a public key that anyone in the world can have. So to open up a box, well, the box is locked with a private key and I can open it with a public key. So this is a way of doing encryption where I take my letter and I put it in a box and I encrypt it with my public key. So you can think of me taking this thing and locking it in a box. Now that document is in a letter and I send it to the person who has the private key and they can open it. So when we talk about public and private keys, and I'm not gonna explain the math, what we have is a way of locking something that anyone can lock, but it's super hard to unlock. So I can take a message intended for my friend here, D, put it in a box, put a lock on it, send it to my friend. Anyone else can get a locked box. They can't do anything with it unless they have the key for that padlock. And this is why it's called a public key encryption. It's because there's a public and a private component to it. This person can decrypt it. And then this person might say, okay, I'm going to lock this in a box using your private thing. And then you can open it. This is how encryption works. Good news here is the person in the middle can't do anything. All they see is a bunch of locked boxes going back and forth, but they don't have the keys. Now, encryption is wonderful, but it's also a little scary. What should we be worrying about? Well, language was the original method of encoding knowledge. This is an Egyptian script using used for recording affairs of state and planting crops and so on. Uh, in fact, the Egyptians knew about antibiotics and sutures and coagulation well before 0 BC. But through most of its long history, this language was used for writing administrative documents, accounts, legal texts, letters, as well as mathematical, medical, literary, and religious texts. But information is encoded. And sometimes the people who have that encoding are able to lock it up. So during the Greco-Roman period, when Greek had become the chief administrative script, this language called hieratic was primarily limited to religious texts. Um, hieratic was far more important to the Egyptians than hieroglyphs being used as a script for daily life. It's actually really hard to read unless you have something like the Rosetta Stone to unlock it. For a long time, religions and leaders controlled reading and the creation of documents. In fact, the word clerk it originally meant persons in holy orders who were called clerics, and only the priests could read and write. No one else knew how. So you had limited access to information. Something that drives me nuts, and fortunately we don't have DVDs anymore, is the user operation prohibited. If you've ever watched a DVD, there's this thing where you paid for the DVD and you'd like to press a button to skip the warning. I mean, you bought a legitimate copy of this thing. Why are you the person that's getting the anti-piracy warning, but you can't skip it? This means that someone else is forcing you to consume or not consume information, whether you want to or not, even though you licensed the information. <coughs> Fortunately, the EFF is trying to get rid of this process. But we can limit the ability to, to um, liberate that data. There's something called the High Definition Copy Protocol, or HDCP, uh, which says you can't plug your TV into your DVD player. And while it's supposed to prevent copying, it can also prevent it from actually sending information to your TV. So those things that you thought you could play are no longer yours. The uh, Digital Copyright Millennium Act makes it illegal to distribute technology to get around that stuff. DRM lets us revoke information. You can say, hey, I don't like that thing. I'm going to lock it up. And then that person can't watch it because I've revoked the key. And so now you can't watch your movie anymore. Um, and there's lots of examples of this. If you're trying to play things on older Windows systems, you simply can't play them anymore because the, the permissions ran out or the organization that was supposed to be letting you go to this thing went out of business. So the file has no media rights. And this is happening with redacted content and so on. So 
tying information to how it's used is a very dangerous first step on an incredibly slippery slope. And I think when it comes to DRM and cryptography, it's really important to consider the consequences of all this stuff happening. Now, there's lots and lots of other things to talk about with technology here, but what I want to do is wrap up with a few thoughts on this subject because uh, there's tons and tons of things we could talk about, but the reality is that um, we're here to talk primarily about how technology affects government. I want you to go back to the first part. When we move from analog to digital, some things become hard and some things become easy. All of the technology we looked at so far, the internet, the web, cloud computing, AI, cryptography, are all consequences of taking information, encoding it as numbers, making those numbers binary, and then transmitting those binary numbers through electricity, which is fast and free. The most important thing you need to do is to recalibrate the underlying risk Digital government is usually about fixing a user interface or reducing costs. The UX of paper and phone wasn't very good. It was inconsistent, couldn't offer options to people, couldn't converse with the citizen. But the cost reductions and the risks are different. If you, for example, think about uh, risk and costs, you generally have to consider these in terms of what's the cost and what's a false positive or false negative. If you're an AI or you're making algorithms, Obviously a false positive. You think someone is guilty, they're not, and you shoot them because of predictive policing. That's an incredibly high cost for a false positive. If you don't identify a cancer, and as a result, you can't save the patient's life, that's an incredibly high cost for a false negative. But if you suggested a Netflix show to someone and it didn't really matter and they didn't like it much, that's a low cost false positive. And if you you know, weren't suggested a song that you might have liked, that's a low cost false negative. So you need to recalibrate your risk about what is the downstream cost of that thing. Because in digital, perfect really is the enemy of good enough. The old way was deploy it once. So it has to be perfect, the battleship. The new way is it's iterative. It just has to be an improvement. But we haven't updated our processes for budgeting and for planning and for things like that. We, there's a tendency to ignore the real world components of digital to say, oh, it's magical. That's where your real risks are. Can I get people to adopt this? Can I staff it? And can I train people on it? So here's my sort of checklist for people who are trying to make good decisions in a digital world. First of all, understand what the real risks are, because all of those laws I showed early on mean that things have changed. The cost of copying, the cost of experimentation, and so on. Don't start with a solution. Don't say, I need this technology. Start with a desired outcome. What do I want? And then work back from there to the technology. Define the whole product. Paint a picture of what this thing will work like when it's finished, but then work on the first version. Uh, and I used an example of this the other day. If you're trying to drive somewhere, but you don't know if the car works, you know that your vision is, I want to drive to the campsite and have a wonderful weekend camping. But the first step is going to be put the ignition in the key, in the car. Does the key fit? Yes. Okay. We now know the key is right for this car. Turn the ignition. Does the car start? Yes. We know the engine works. Put your foot on the uh, brake pedal and put it into drive. Does the gear engage? Okay. We know the transmission works. Drive forward a little bit. Does the car work? Yes, it does. These are all steps that we build in very succinct ways to get ourselves to the point where we can go on a camping weekend. So to find the whole product, go on a camping weekend, and then work up to the, on the first version by identifying the initial risks and testing those things out. Know your goals and metrics up front and build them in from the start because metrics are easy. Make things modular and reusable. Build components and Lego bricks. Uh, within your team, you want to have somebody who thinks about um, how to build the thing, how somebody thinks about getting attention for the thing, somebody who thinks about how it interacts with humans, and someone who analyzes stuff. Uh, realize that learning counts as work. If you're thinking a problem through without things to show, but it saves time in the long run, especially when you're working with information, uh, learning by running a first version of something and seeing what worked counts. Experimentation is cheap. And finally, build the cost of operations into your system. Well, that was 90 minutes about technology. And I know that was a lot to consume. And so I'm going to wrap things up now. Uh, thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, Rebecca, did you want to pop in and say some stuff? I'm not sure if Becky's going to join us today. Oh, hi, Becky. How are you? You love just putting me on the spot. Hi. I do. That was great. I was thoroughly entertained. Oh, it's a lot of content. Very educational. <laughs>
I'm not camera ready. You put me on the spot here. Anyway, that was great. We are pretty much out of time. Um, we're going to be doing uh, another session in May upcoming. So keep an eye on uh, on newsletters and announcements about the changing role of the chief data officer in uh, the government of Canada. We've had a lot of response for that. It's the one that we rescheduled. We're really excited to join um, Peter Bruce and Ryan Andrusoff and a bunch of great CDOs to learn all about uh, the work they've been doing. But yeah, that's it. Thanks for joining us and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much, everyone.